Well, it's Monday morning, coffee with Job. And this is the last week. We are into chapter 42 and I can hardly believe this. There, I've done a, by the time we finish this week, I've done 140 of these looking at this amazing book in Job. And when I look back over the, the time that we've been doing this, uh, I know that there are some people who began listening to this who are now with the Lord in glory. Uh, there are many, there are people who are mourning. There is such tremendous sorrow and, and, and difficulty and trouble in this world. And yet Job speaks into that situation. So we're at what's called the epilogue, and that's verses 7 to 17. And it shifts from poetry and the dramatic poetry to prose. And to be honest, there are people who think it's quite prosaic prose. It's kind of uh, Job prays for his friends. Job has all his fortunes restored. Job gets a new family. And they all live happily ever after. But I don't think it's prosaic at all. And I think when you look at this, it's really quite remarkable. And this is the end. Now, I, again, I've been so helped, as I said, by reading Christopher Ashe's commentary on this, and I commend that again. But he says something really interesting here, that this is the end for Job. But you and I, were not at our end yet. We don't know what the end will be. In fact, that's one of the problems. We, we're, we're stuck not knowing what the end is. I like that phrase, um, I saw it on a t-shirt once, please be patient with me, God is not finished with me yet. When I'm thinking of the end, I'm thinking of the very dramatic music at the end of Apocalypse Now, with the doors, uh, this is the end, and just everything being destroyed. Well, Job's end is not that. Now, it's interesting, in the New Testament, we've not said this much, but in James chapter 5 and verse 11, it's talking about suffering. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Now, given what happened to Job, it's sometimes difficult for people to say the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And some of you, you are in illness, you are mourning, you're, you're, you're struggling with, with mental health issues, struggling with discouragement. Your church is a mess. And you're saying, how's the Lord full of compassion and mercy? Well, he is. He is. And that's where the perseverance comes in. You hold on to that. Perseverance is, as Ash points out, it's warfare. We are in a spiritual battle and we need to hold on. It's a bit like... I don't know um, what's going to happen in Ukraine, but imagine you're in one of these besieged cities and you're just holding on, waiting for it all to end. Well, I entitled this section, though, not so much about this, just this one verse we're going to look at. Verse 7, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Well, it's interesting, by the way, Elihu is not mentioned here, but Job's three friends, they've not spoken the truth about God. And I, I, I did, and I entitled this saying, what makes God angry? It's when we lie about God. Not just when we deliberately say things that are wrong, but even when we mistakenly say things that are wrong. But didn't Job do so? He said some terrible things about God. Well, there's, there's two ways to look at this. One is to say that God says, I'm speaking about the things that he said that were right. Job did speak things that were right about me. Or the other is this way, and this is, I, I like how Ash puts this, that his three friends had faith in a system and they spoke about their system. Job had a relationship with God and sometimes he spoke wrongly out of frustration. But, his longing and his heart was for God. It's like having that thirst for God. I love um, when I, I wrote this Magnificent Obsession, uh, I got the title from a BBC documentary, an everyman documentary called How to Get to Heaven in Montana. 
And it was a story of a group of Amish where a number of the younger Amish or Mennonites had become born again Christians. And the BBC, it was an amazing program, uh, filmed them for a year and then put this program out. I just thought it was absolutely stunning. And at one point, the son of the pastor who had become a young man, young Mennonite man who'd become a believer, the presenter of the program behind the mic says, what does Jesus mean to you? You, you? you seem very, you know, taken up with Jesus. And he said this, I've never forgotten this. I was a teenager and I never forgot this. His, his eyes filled with tears and he said, Jesus, Jesus, he's my everything. He is my magnificent obsession. Well, I think that's where Job was coming from. And that's why God calls Job his servant. You've not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. That covenant relationship. Incidentally, in the New Testament, and our time is gone, but I want to finish. Everything for me nowadays just comes back to Romans 8. I refer everything to Romans 8. But in the New Testament, we are called children. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14, are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs with God, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I think that is a fabulous commentary on the book of Job. All right, um, God willing, see you tomorrow as we continue to look at this, these final verses in this wonderful book. May the Lord bless you. Bye.